about now is the rich analogy, navigating the outer city canon. This session is sponsored by the Royal Philharmonic Society, and I'm really pleased to be here to chair it. I think it'll be a really important discussion, asking where does originality come from, how do we know if it's any good, and what is its relationship to the past. We're going to be talking across the arts forums, and I've got a really well-qualified panel to address some of these questions. The way this will work is like many of the sessions today, I'll introduce very briefly our speakers. They'll speak for five minutes. I have red cards and yellow cards to tell them off if they're not doing it properly. Um, we'll have a conversation between ourselves and then we'll open it out to you for your points and contributions. Everybody should have a chance to speak and um, just give us a little bit of time. Speaking first um, is Jane. Jane's on my far left. It's Jane McCadden for you. She's a sculptor and multidisciplinary artist. She's a teacher and sculptor at Centre St Martins, the University of Arts and Royal College London. After her, in the multicolours kind of 1970s <laughs> retro sweater, is Igor Toroni Malik, who is a curator and documentary filmmaker, and he's co-founder of the Arts Desk. Um, a website that has some really interesting criticism and is doing rather well, which is quite nice to see. After Igor, we'll hear from Piers Halliwell, who is a composer. Piers is just next to Igor. He's a professor of composition at Queen's University, Belfast. And then, on my immediate right, is Joe Frigieri, head of philosophy at the University of Malta. He's a Renaissance man, so he's not just a philosopher, he's a poet, playwright, and theatre director won three times the National Literary Prize. And then we will hear from Carl Sharrow. Carl is a Middle East commentator, so, so far he's been talking about the Arab Spring. <laughs> he has things that things slightly different. He is an architecture and a cultural commentator, and you will hear from him last. But first, I'm going to hand it over to Jane for your five minutes. Jane. Okay. If you can't hear us at any stage, tell us, because we belong to you can't define it, but it's there, and you'll only ever recognize it when you see it. This was the slogan for the invitation to the Central St. Martin School of Art free show this year. Fortunately, we still live in a time of postmodernism, defined by the Oxford Dictionary as a mixing of different artistic styles and media, and a general distrust of theory. In visual art, Anything goes and crossovers are welcome. Grayson Perry is a prime example with his fluency of self expression taking him from his biographical pop sold in craft shops to sculpture on show at the British Museum. Not to mention his transition from man to woman, the flick of an eyebrow pencil, and a beautifully made dress. We've done well to discover those talented artists who work from their own experience and to reward their originality. In Grace and Perry, we struck gold because we got the glitz along with the goods. Perry works in the tradition of the older self-defining artists like Gilbert and George, whose togetherness formed part of their work from their early days at St. Martin School of Art in the 60s. The door's been open to original vision for some decades. Visual art is no longer an elitist activity, and this is something to be celebrated. The other example is Tracy Emin, with her very personal confessional art, such as her unmade bed. Emin ignored the idea that artists don't speak about personal experience. Unrelated, but alongside Emin's rise, emerged the need for the artist's statement required for grant funding, curators' essays, and the need to engage an audience. The cuts in arts funding also made it necessary to speak up for and about art. Artists themselves are now allowed to speak, which has succeeded in catching the attention of the media and so the wider public. We've made art in general more accessible, learning to speak and write about it without pretension. Traditionally, we were not expected to speak. Attempts at language were alienating. Let the work speak, was the artist's mantra. The traditional is, however, overshadowed by the current, the new, the different, the eccentric, and the brave, who are seen in this world of overkill and desensitization 
and more newsworthy. Is self-definition more interesting than the defined? If something doesn't stand out and speak to us, it is not seen. One of the Arts Council's concerns is with widening participation. With the Olympics, the winners were set as examples to encourage the rest of us. The message to the youth being, you can do it too. Within the arts, there is that same possibility, you can do it too. There is now unprecedented public interest in contemporary art. We come from one extreme to the other. From the visual arts engaging a tiny percentage of the cultural elite, to it being seen by queues of people at the state galleries. Some may say we've done the art down, but I disagree. A Monet is still A Monet, but many more are interested in seeing it now. The increased accessibility and interest hasn't taken anything away from the masters. Fashion and fans come and go, but what is enduring emerges in time. In the end, history decides what is a valuable contribution to a movement. Potentially, all can actively partake now with the internet, performance, pop-up venues and street art. We are awash with creativity. Our task is to pick out the wheat from the chaff. Websites such as Axis operate as a means of verifying who's who in contemporary art. More of, this, more of this sort of thing on the web might help to ascertain what is rooted and coherent work. The web is here to stay. Life is now fast-paced. And as has always been, art reflects life. Embracing the new is a challenge, but also an imperative, as this availability to express is probably saving the mental lives of our otherwise disenfranchised youth, while their jobs, education, youth clubs, and futures have been whipped away with the stroke of a pen, their creativity cannot be taken. Thank you, Jane. Igor, what are your thoughts? And these well, mics. Yeah, sorry. So I just um, I just finished a, 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 a new book. It's a history of opera. It's a very, very good book. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was kind of confused with the fact that Rossini took up about 40, 50 pages in a 600 page book. And the last 80 years of opera took up 30 years. Um, this was because the author has this, this theory, um, which is that the reason why opera has gone on the slide and no one really cares about it anymore is because it became obsessed with originality. It became obsessed with newness, and opera is essentially an art form that works on formula. It's a traditional art form. This is not a viewpoint actually kind of confined to. Uh, to people in opera and classical music, I think it's quite a common, common opinion that essentially we've gone too far. We made a fetish out of originality, and this kind of leads to this idea that creativity is almost like a oil deposit. It's sort of going to dry up really soon. We've come up with so much new stuff that soon we're going to have no more new stuff to access. And they cite history in their defense. They say, you know, originality was a thing we invented, 20th century invented. And in the olden days, of course, you know, no one really cared about originality. Uh, and they, then you can cite numerous people hand and borrowing from uh, various operas that he wrote, rather than being endlessly original each time. Titian, uh, Charles V, his hound, he copied that. You know, it's, it's a direct copy. Uh, of another artist's uh, painting. And they cite this as an example of the fact that it was a sort of, it's a more um, uh, complex and um, interesting time because originality wasn't the dominant force for art. Um, the implication here is that we can be in originality. That's, that, that's what it, these, these historians are doing. This revisionism essentially is saying that we've gone too far, let's back off. Originality, originality can be sort of ditched for a little, little while. I'm here to argue that that's fundamentally wrong in every way. Uh, I'm, I'm here to defend originality and uh, explain why it's intrinsically a good thing and also should have no limits on it. Um, I also pinpoint three examples of major threats to um, our desire for, or artists' desire for originality and innovation. The history argument is bogus, of course. Um, even at the time that Handel was writing, 
there were critics of his borrowing. People noticed that this wasn't a really very decent way to behave. Um, Titian, when you see the two paintings that people talk about, it, there's, a, there's so much more added to the painting that he stole from. There is originality, there is his personality. This type of personality that we thought that a lot of revisionist historians think is, think is consigned to 20, the 20th century alone. Um, and, and even if we look at the most conservative era for culture, something like uh, uh, Byzantium, icons had a, a, a sense of the hand that was um, painting it. It, it. They changed in, in smaller ways, but they definitely changed. Um, if we accept this argument, you can see why I sort of think it's self-evident why originality is a good thing. Uh, obviously, it's an intrinsic element of the creative act. How do we express ourselves except through new thoughts, uh, through latest, the, using the latest media? And why would we want to prohibit ourselves from using the latest media, the latest ideas? Beyond this, there's, this, there's, there's actually beyond the mechanics of making art for which originality is vital. There's, there's something about originality that is just simply attractive. The, the original has to put himself out there. They have to be the clown. Um, there's a generosity in this willingness to be the object of ridicule. If anyone goes on YouTube, watch uh, this brilliant clip of John Cage on um, a 1950s panel show called I've Got a Secret, where he does one of his wackier compositions and everyone just laughs at him. This is brave stuff. Uh, it's not an easy option to be the fool, to be the clown. You know, a lot of people hate visual artists as a result of the kind of um, annoying things they do. But uh, out of that, out of that sort of, uh, you know, out of the stuff that they do that is annoying, they'll produce something that is very interesting. <coughs> that we can be sure. Of. Um, so, what are the threats to originality? Here am I losing. Um, public funding. I think is the biggest threat to originality. Um, what happened with public funding is that if we, if we look at something public art, which is the most sort of uh, consistently and, and heavily publicly funded of all the art forms, every, every other art form has a mixed economy. Public art has really only a public subsidy. And we can see that what happens is instrumentalization takes hold. Uh, bureaucrats in local councils don't care about whether the art is any good, whether it's original, uh, whether it's sort of fostering and creating furthering art. All they care about is if uh, the, the price of the neighbourhood, the, the, the house prices might go up, or if it might improve community cohesion. Or, you know, there's even one, uh, the Hastings um, did their public art programme on the grounds that it would reduce death rates from circularity disease and cancer in the UK. That's deadly serious, that was one of their reasons. This is all very noble, these are very good things, we should try to do these things, but this is not art's role. And if we look at another example, I think in classical music, we can see another way in which public subsidy has um, uh, slightly messed up the, uh, the economy, the economic, the climate, um, the environment of classical music. It, is, it has led to cliques, academic cliques, by, by essentially allowing those in, in power to distribute the money. It has, it has forced classical music down a, a route where it's very hard to break the the people who did break the model had to leave the art form to break the model. The most exciting classical composers of the last 50 years did their stuff in Gann art galleries and in, 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 in sound art. Today's Mozart is more likely to be out in the East End living as a sound artist than coming from the Royal Academy. Um, and, you know, it, 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 two, there's this act, the, the, the other, the second reason why there's a threat to originality is this idea of um, academic thinking. Um, revisionist academic thinking um, on the history of originality that I mentioned before. There's this tendency to um, say that we need to slow down the pace of change. And this gives us a sucker to sort of irredent, um, sort of troglodytes like the Stuckists and people like that. And also terrible composers in a sort of neo britonesque pastoral mode. I mean, for example, this opera book seriously suggests that we should... It's a great book, though. It is genuinely a very good book, but the last 30 pages are pretty obscene. Because it suggests that you know, we should look to Benjamin Britten as an example for the future of our compositional uh, ways. This is absurd. You know? He died 40, 50 years ago. So the third, uh, the third and most troublesome uh, threat to our, to, our, um, to, to our desire for originality is 
cultural peasantism, this idea that we don't have Mozart living among us today. Um, and this is unique. This, I think, you know, the, the amount of visceral hatred people have for our buildings, for our music, for our art, in, in, all, in all its forms, is remarkable. And I think, you know, it, if only we worked with tr traditions, you know, there's this idea that if only we were, we were skilled and we did life drawing and studied counterpoint, blah, 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 we'd be far, you know, far more, uh, producing far more consequential work. But what actually that leads to is the kind of society which, the, which, the, which, the, which uh, essentially um, uh, epitomized the Byzantine Empire, which was a straitjacketed society. Uh, and it, and this, there was a quote about the, the way that Byzantine art was hemorrhaged by its subservience to the past that I just want to read out. It said that the, the example of ancient Greece serves as a straitjacket which kept its prisoner in a state of mental retardation. I think that's what we are, uh, what, that's the fear um, that, 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 that that will happen if we lose uh, touch with the fact that originality is key uh, to better art, uh, more art for the future. So, yeah, well, I'm not going to say very much about originality, but just um, what's just like to disagree with Igor because I prefer the word individuality anyway because uh, I think every, you know we all know that when a student starts searching for you know to be original the the results are not are not promising and that uh, it's no guarantee of you know durable expression and so on so I prefer the idea that individuality is what characterizes the art that stays with us I think T.S. Eliot said something about don't try to be traditional, or trying to be traditional is as uh, fruitless as trying to be original. Nobody discovers that very much that's new. Um, but uh, I think there are a number. Of, I think there is a number of issues that stalk this landscape of um, uh, the artistic canon and how it relates to our lives that I'll just throw out. In fact, one of them people have already thrown out. So I'll, I'll chime in with that. Um, the first to do with music is just that there is no mainstream now, and therefore it's extremely, uh, it's extremely difficult to, to, to agree on what we're even discussing. Um, one of the leaders of our London orchestra said uh, in a discussion a decade ago, something that's always stuck with me, which is that every area of music is now a minority. And I think it's particularly true in this art form, I don't know what it is in art form, um, more so than maybe with some of the other art forms on the panel. Um, so, there is no one thing. We all think that the music that informs our lives is the mainstream and is something that's owned. But I would perhaps use the image of the Olympics as a collection of sports where there are some that have massive ownership, like the um, like 100 meters or something, is a kind of uh, you know the popular core. But then at the same time, there are the the tippy wings and all the other things that attract attractive you know audiences, people enjoying them, people being extremely kind of informed by them, and these all add up to something called the Olympics, and each one of them, even the 100 metres, is a minority, and that's certainly true of music. <laughs> the second thing I want to say is just about the, the collapse of what I would call training, and this is that I do not think that participating in art is a passive thing, and it should not be confused, for example, with you know, watching television or something. You have to acquire the skills to participate because it is an active thing. And perhaps to use a sporting metaphor again, you know, we can all have fun knocking a ball around a tennis court with our children, uh, or you know, whatever like that. But we can have much, we can get much more out of it if we're sort of actually engaged in trying to to learn how this works. And I think this is very important in in this country now that the UK curriculum has largely discarded the idea of training how we interact with the art, with, with the arts. For example, you know, I'm a skilled listener to not all, but you know, some areas of music, but I feel a complete clodhopper when it comes to uh, meaningfully interacting with, with some visual arts and going to the theatre. And but because of my generation, I have had a certain amount of kind of uh, you know, general training in that. And I think that those of us who take that for granted because we were lucky enough to have some kind of mainstream cultural education are not in a good position to then be pulling it away from the curriculum so that 
for example, children are not instructed in what you can take from looking at a picture, how you can, how you can make sense of what questions it raises. So I'm very concerned about that because I do think that interacting with art is an active thing. It's a skill, and the skill can be acquired and should be acquired, and we should not pull out of the responsibility for that. Finally, just this is the one that I'm um, chiming in uh, with Igor here, um, I think it's a real danger that those of us who are engaged in the complex arts or the, you know, the experimental arts, there's a real danger that we become complicit in a narrative about our irrelevance and about our unimportance. And I think this is strongly led by the numbers game, driven by something that really has nothing to do with what many of us do. In other words, uh, the putting on of uh, spectacle in large, uh, you know, really large venues, the I'm sure the accountants or the promoters who fill the Millennium Dome with uh, you know, Adele or Rihanna or whoever it is are very much concerned as to whether they can be filled for three nights in succession and whether they can get 20,000 people. That really has nothing to do with what we, what we do. And it's a terrible kind of burden that we drag around. And I would suggest, for example, that more people now, because there are so many more of us, because we have recorded media, we now have the internet and all that, I would say that many more of us can engage with the most difficult, obscure art than uh, in the past. I mean, it'd be unfair to choose an example like Bach in the 1740s, where he was not widely known, known as a player rather than a composer. But you know, I wonder how many people even got to see the Wagner operas in the 1860s, and compared with how many people can engage now with the music of Bert Russell, or, I mean, even the music of someone like myself. There are just so many more of us. It's so different that at least comparisons and these sort of sagas of uh, decline and irrelevance that uh, Igor mentioned are really, really two-dimensional and, and, and kind of feeble. So I think we should be far more proactive about that. You know, I had a, one of the most recent orchestral concerts was uh, in a provincial hall, a provincial orchestra, there were lots of non-specialist people there, lot of tourists, and I introduced something. At the end of it, you know, people came up and a couple of people asked for autographs and things, and they didn't ask them because they're valuable or they can do anything with them. It's just because they felt involved. They felt some kind of ownership. And I thought that told me far more than all the kind of gloom about how 0.006% of people take part in this or that area of contemporary arts. And people are out there enjoying it. This place is full of people enjoying it, as, as I know from you know, past experience. Wonderful things happening, everybody going to, you know, people going to shows. We need to educate people and make it possible for them to do so, but we should not knock ourselves out. And uh, I think in the same way, for example, maybe, maybe the Christian church should uh, worry more about the, the depth of the spiritual experience instead of constantly counting how many people are coming through the doors. And I think we need to do that in the same way in terms of the arts. Concentrate on making our art stand up, making it coherent, making it individual, and educate people, and then you know they will come. It is not a numbers game that belongs to a completely different area. Um, just to end on a sporting theme, I mean, I think about, for example, rock climbers clinging to a rock face on a Saturday afternoon. They are absolutely not worrying about how many thousands of people are in a football match down, uh, you know, across the country, and they're not watching the rock climb. They're clinging to the rock face for very good reasons. And I think that kind of concentration is the sort of thing we should focus on, make the art, and uh, make, and bring people in when we can, but that isn't what it's about, that's a distraction. Thank you, Jen. Um, I'd like to make two points, if I may. The first point is that the category of the artistic is being wide and varied, so that what, what one says about a particular art form, say painting or sculpture, we have to try without qualification to another art form, say music, or literature, or architecture. Our assessment of the importance of art in our lives will depend on our direct experience of it, which may show partiality for one art form rather than another. Though in the end, such an experience will have to enhance our lives in some way if we are to attribute any kind of value to it. And my second point concerns the canon. I think there are clear and valid reasons why certain works will always feature among those that are most widely read, played, admired, and performed. That the reasons lie in the quality of the works themselves. The fact that they form part of the tradition does not in itself make them bold or passé. Because of their richness, depth, and complexity, they can be understood and interpreted in many ways. 
But such different interpretations will allow different aspects of the works to be revealed, so that no sensitive performance of a musical score or theatrical text will be exactly like any other. Uh, as a theatre critic once wrote, every century has recast Shakespeare in its own image. Uh, the comment may be extended to cover every memorable rendering of the works of any great writer, playwright, or composer. So in thinking of the great works of the artistic canon, one should never lose sight of the input of directors, performers, and conductors, just as one should not underestimate the great role of readers, viewers, and listeners in their response to the arts. In the theatre especially, the seasoned conductor, artistic director, actor, or performer will take the audience on a journey of discovery, bringing new life into a well-known piece by injecting a dose of creative energy that will transform its performance into a fresh, unique, and memorable experience. And when this happens, as it often does, it will never be a question of sheer repetition or of passive consumers, and I quote, simply lapping up the repack repackaged the greatest hits of yesterday. And my final point concerns originality. In the structure of scientific revolutions, which was published in 1962, Thomas Kuhn distinguished between normal and revolutionary science, introducing the notion of a paradigm shift, the kind of radical change in perspective separating Ptolemy from Copernicus and Newtonian mechanics from Einstein's physics. One could read the history of art along the same lines as a series of relatively long periods of normal art punctuated by a relatively small number of paradigm shifts brought about by the creative genius of a few innovators and giving rise to a succession of movements or styles. The great paradigm shift marking the contemporary artistic scene is of a different nature. And now that in Dante's story, the old narratives of linear progress towards a common goal have come to an end, any artistic aim, style, or method can be considered valid. Unity, profundity, high seriousness, universality, and decorum give way to eclecticism, irony, pluralism, contingency, and playfulness as artists embrace the latest technology to undermine the traditional distinction between high art and popular culture. The ability to shock, perplex, and provoke comes to be appreciated as an aesthetic value, while the traditional idea of firmness, and the Sabo's test of time, is no longer accorded the kind of importance it used to enjoy. The real, in Baudrillard's words, is not what it used to be. Uh, flooded by media images and subjected to a constant barrage of advertising hype, artists will either incorporate such simulations into the wrong work or react to them by creating the wrong counter-representations. As a result of this process, new ways of expression will emerge, forcing us to extend the concept of the artistic to cover its new manifestations. So the canon will change and is bound to change, not just by the inclusion of new works, but also as a result of the widening of the criteria by which they are judged. Contemporary trends, in particular, oblige us to be much more flexible in our definitions of art and its objects in the way we look at the role of the artist in our assessment of the nature of the aesthetic experience and of what would be expected of us as readers, viewers, or listeners. Thank you. Oh. As Tiffany mentioned, I was just speaking in two sessions about the Arab Spring and the canon means something else over there. <laughs> so I have to reset a little bit. I'm a big fan of originality. I may not show it in my clothes, but I am. <laughs> and the point is that I really want to make is we're living in a culture and context that makes originality impossible. The mere fact that we ask the question, can we be original, and start dwelling on the reasons for that, reveals a sense of this lack of self-confidence. Because surely, it's not an individual failure. We haven't, as individuals, lost the ability to be creative. What has changed is our historic relationship with the world, and our kind of tendency to become more reluctant and uh, place limits 
on how we transform the world and how we view it. And that's very catastrophic to the notion of originality. So there's a sense of kind of uh, uh, confused conservatism <coughs> that remains. And the best way I can illustrate it is this building itself. The bar, think about it. It was a very kind of original breakthrough of building for its time. But our reaction to it today is to kind of list it and preserve it and say you can't touch it, you can't change anything about it. Everybody loves it, but try to propose building another bar in London today and you'll be shut down because we don't do things that way. So the point that I want to make really is that lack of the disappearing cultural context that celebrates originality not only a mere formal experimentation, and that applies not only in the visual arts, but in music and literature and architecture indeed, uh, is kind of uh, robs the act of originality from its transformative potential. If you look at modernism in particular, the search for originality wasn't a kind of flippant, self-indulgent uh, way to come across new forms. It was an expression of a zeitgeist. And that was linked to the very crucial existential question of what is meaning? What is so? How do we kind of, in a post-God world, find, find these things? And then it had that context. Today, we don't have that. We have a kind of over-deference to nature. We have a lot of deference uh, to social organization. We're much more reluctant to interfere in these situations. And I give a small example from a kind of day job in architecture, where I interview a lot of young architects to work for us. And it's very interesting, because they show me this very futuristic drawings, and I think this has to be a settlement on the moon or something like that. So when I ask them what it is, inevitably it's a lettuce farm in South China, or a date farm in Saudi Arabia, and basically there's a process to repeat itself. So they look at leaves and find the pattern, and then reproduce it using computer uh, parametrics, it's called. And I don't know why they reproduce it, because the pattern exists. But they basically produce these very futuristic looking villages. And you ask them, do you know what you've produced? There are people here who make cows and pick dates for a living. And it's sort of all done in a very stylized, uh, very formalistically uh, kind of advanced form. But it's entirely shiny. That is not the vision that drove the people that designed the Barbican, for example, or architects like Corbusier, or even artists like uh, Marcel Duchamp, who we might come back to his relationship to. Uh, contemporary art, in the sense that they weren't looking there for this uh, kind of isolated uh, formal expressions that are lacking meaning, that are lacking in reference, which is the kind of the situation that we find ourselves in. It was much more linked to a social exploration, the question of what is it to be modern, how do we live a modern life, how do we transform our life, then art fits within that picture. Now, unfortunately, what happens when that collapses, and we don't have time to dwell on that, but I'm sure we're all aware of that cultural collapse and that moment, as Igor called it, of cultural pessimism that I see beyond the art, kind of reflects and produces this sort of uh, uh, fragmented formalistic explorations. It leads us into areas of self-referentiality, recycling uh, images and artistic forms, and it kind of becomes more and more uh, this, this kind of disconnected from any relevance. People can't relate to it. Now, faced with that kind as a person in a previous era, I would have been a complete revolutionary iconoclast. I would have been saying, let's destroy the institution, let's destroy museums, let arts go down to the street. Unfortunately, that kind of cultural transformation puts us in a different situation. The radical act today is defend the hand, is to defend the institution against, as a kind of an act of defiance against this attack on the value of high art, which could only be appreciated, again, as Igor kind of talked about, against instrumentalism, for its own sake. That's the only way you can value it. In order to defend that legacy of art that we have, I think we're in a moment where the radical thing to do is to defend that, but to say, point to the future and say, read originality, it's not about formal experimentation, but it's about more radical re-questioning, philosophical re-questioning of our broader social attitudes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'd like to try and clarify, if possible, a few things 
on the panel before I open it out to you. I think there's been quite mixed views on whether originality is possible, whether we're too steeped in originality, and whether it's under attack. So let's try and unpick that a little bit. I wonder if I could come to Jane and Eagle first, because you seem to both <coughs> think that, if I can paraphrase, originality is in danger, and to abandon it would be a problem. Can you defend that a little bit? Do you think it is originality is in danger? No, um, I think originality is out there, and we don't like it. I think it comes out of the personal, that becomes the universal. Uh, when it's good, and then people can uh, identify with those contemporary artworks, for example. There's, there's, that, there's a reason why the Tate model has cues, you know. It, there is, but I go to Tate model, but I don't necessarily like what's in it. I do think something's happened to cultural institutions, which is very attractive to go to, but not necessarily for the work. I mean, the, the problem I have with your <laughs> argument is I've heard from particularly the contemporary art sector for a long time that they're original and new and shocking. You know, Carl mentioned Duchamp, that was 1912. It's now 100 years later. So maybe originality is tired. You know, maybe we've um, had too much originality. I'm very, I'm very sanguine. I mean, I think, you know, it's very nice. You don't anymore hear people saying, well, is it art or oh, my child could do it? That kind of argument is very 90s. Uh, it's completely disappeared, you know, only total troglodytes can utter it. And, it. and it's very heartening, I have total faith. And I'm seeing this in, I mean, people really accept conceptual art. It's amazing. It's like, it's like the smoking ban. I mean, our, our habit for mistrusting art in the 90s has completely been reversed, I'd say. And I, and, but there are a few people who don't think that. So my worry is with warriors. I mean, I don't think there's a problem. I, I, I disagree with them. Uh, sorry, I forgot the name of the architect there. Carl. It's Carl, sorry. Uh, because uh, I, I see lots of very original stuff all the time. So what makes it original and what, what can you say is good? I don't want to go into that. I mean, that is, that is a mind problem of what is good. Uh, what, what is it? I mean, I'm not a philosopher. I don't do that. I know what I like. I know what excites me, what entertains me. Um, it's, uh, you know, I think that's a, that's a mind problem. Okay. <laughs> For me, I, I, it's a, that's an original, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> what makes it original, though? What about the, the point that you could really only know if you can compare it to a canon? So you have to have some sense of the past. Is it the sort of relationship between the two? Do you recognise? Yes, you. No, 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 no um, I got Oh, sorry, yeah. uh, what, how do you recognise it as being original? Yeah, yeah, you can have comparisons. I mean, it's something visceral. I don't think people... I think people know about it. You know, I, I, I don't think you have to think about these things that hard. You know, I, I think uh, usually, well, I'd say all good art is original. Not all original art is good. Uh, so we start from that premise. Every good piece, every piece that we respond to, will have originality there somewhere. So um, I think that's somewhere to start. And do you recognize anything that the, um, I think Carl, Joe, and Piers alluded to? about um, an ambivalence towards the past and the problems therein. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think we're too dismissive of the past in any way whatsoever? Uh, no, I think we should be more. I mean, I'm, I'm with Carl in, in that, you know, I, I, I would be, you know, tear down the institutions. And I think at the moment, you know, it is remarkable how the left are holding up the conservative sort of uh, position, which is keep the state funding to all the arts in exactly the proportion that, you know, opera must stay opera, Art must say art. This is this. I mean, this is so conservative. Um, public funding, the, the left, um, is actually uh, in, in institutionalizing a very, very conservative um, system of rigidity in the arts. And I think we need to get rid of public funding and see what happens. That would be exciting. Yes, tear down institutions and remove Strikes of dogma to me. I mean, it seems to me that that is originality does not have to be safeguarded. Opera does not have to be safeguarded by the institutions, but we don't have to be prescriptive about it. People should be enabled to create artworks in the, you know, within or outside the kind of tent as they want. I mean, I don't like the idea that it's so simple that 
everything that is produced within the system, if we agree what the system means for the moment, that everything produced within the system must be somehow without validity, and everything that is produced in some kind of uh, free nirvana where we all come and spring about untrammeled is, is going to be valid. I mean, some of it will be, and some of it will be terrible. But, fond of Stravinsky's quotation that of course most new work is bad, it always was. And uh, you know, what we get is, is what's left. Um, I mean, as it happens, you mentioned you know, the chances that good stuff will come out of the Royal Academy. Um, I spent yesterday as an external examiner of the Royal Academy of Music because you know, it was one of the other reasons why I'm in town. And some of it wasn't very good, but the best of it was absolutely sensational. And I mean, the young man who produced this disc was so, I was so thrilled that I actually asked him to take it out of the portfolio and keep it. I was deeply moved by it. And he was, you know, he wasn't an especially sophisticated, kind of privileged individual. Um, he was actually sort of giving up his studies to go away and, and be a tree surgeon for a bit. But I mean, you know, the work had absolute authenticity and complexity, and at the heart of it, a kind of uh, expressive power that I was very, that we were all very struck by. So I don't think one can say that it is in the institutions or that it's uh, held back somewhere, undoubtedly is, but there's, there's bad stuff because it's conventional and there's bad stuff because it's unstructured. So I think we're dealing with something much more complicated. Joe, what do you think? You'd probably be described as slightly old-fashioned in your relationship to the canon and the past. How would you? No, I, I was trying to, to make two points, really. One was in favour of the canon, keeping it and reinterpreting make one the canon always come alive, and I think there are ways in which one can do that. You go to the theatre, no interpretation of any opera, of any symphony, might have been the sound exactly the same as any other. So uh, to think of the canon as something that's old or passé, to my mind, is not the right way of thinking about it. And then on the second point I was making, I was saying that originality is there need to be all the time encouraged, but it doesn't need to be encouraged that much, because we are all being encouraged in one way or another. That is, if you ask a child at school to paint a tree or the street where they live, they will always give you a different interpretation of what they see. So originality is not under threat in that sense. The other point I was making is that there are certain iconic moments in the history of art which one needs to take into account. For example, when Marcel Duchamp produced his fountain um, in 1912, well, he produced a, a uranium which was just straight out of the production plant and called it a uh, Signed it how much. Incidentally, when it was presented at the exhibition, it was rejected in New York. But when he did that, then he sort of set the trend for so much that came after him. So if conceptual art is now accepted as something that's normal, that we're used to living with, and so on, that's because there was somebody who did something which was, which was of that kind, the iconic, I call it, in 1912. Same thing applies to Schoenberg, same, same thing applies to the Corbusier, same thing applies to the or, or, or to the Adile, or, or to any of those greats, who then set a trend. But I don't think that I wanted to pit one thing against the other. And if you're in charge of an institution like this one, for example, and I think that's what people do when they're directing the bar and the National Theatre, they need to keep a balance between these two things. There's always room for the canon, and that should never go away because of the qualities I was describing, and for the reasons I was mentioning earlier, but then, of course, you have the new one. The artists, so the contemporary artists, are always knocking at the door. And I find, from my experience as a theatre, the National uh, Theatre in Malta for four years, that when they knock very hard, then eventually they'll get their way. So that's the important. Carl, you've got you in the next report. You said that um, originality was an impossible thing. Are you convinced by your panelists, but... Uh, no, 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 not at all. <laughs> No, no um, But uh, as I said, it's a, it's a culture and context. I mean, of course, there are individual works of art that are quite stunning, but the culture and context to appreciate that is what's the thing, what we're lacking now. Let me give an example on that point of Duchamp. Duchamp's act was done in 1912, but the gesture, as we understand it, is not a product of 1912, it's a product of the 60s. Yeah? It was reinterpreted in the 60s, and it was sort of reattached to this whole train of thought that begins with the 60s. That I think is one of the main attacks against the intrinsic value of art. It leads us to this <coughs> minor that is conceptual art. It's an absolute kind of uh, um, taking the soul out of art 
and we need to overcome that. And I think the problem with that, with Duchamp, it had a kind of a sense of humor, a playfulness about it, that gives way to, to irony and dryness. Yeah? And, and this is what troubles me about it. We are venturing into areas where it's kind of almost like the mathematization of art. It's about creating formulas and kind of uh, uh, permutations of how to produce art. And that troubles me. That's not original. Think about what we celebrate as original moments today. It's like when the iPhone is one centimeter longer, that's seen as a technological leap. But the iPhone is not really a transformative <coughs> object. And I don't mean that in a technological sense, I mean even in terms of what it represents, it's not. So we've kind of lowered our horizons so much that we don't have this ability to understand what originality is. Now, that doesn't mean that original art is not being done, but we're not in a situation where we're able to appreciate it because of this over deference and lack of self-confidence to mess with the world more. So it's the originality, but it doesn't actually exist. Yeah, it doesn't exist in a sense. Like, as I say, the context for it is not there because we've become too shy about being disruptive, about going out there and kind of shuffling things around a little bit, doing things in a different way. So we're bound to kind of get stuck in this situation where originality uh, kind of, I, I think I perceive it, I mean, the example of Tracy Emin is a very good example one, where the person, for example, yields to the autobiographical, becomes more self-indulgent as its social media kind of proceeds further and further. Yeah, but it's, not, it's not a reflection of, of now. It would be absurd to, for us to still want to have exactly the same values as, as people. No, it's not the same values, but where is your revolutionary impulse? That's what I want to ask. Why do you want to have deference? To this situation. Everybody says it's a reflection of this moment because we live in an eclectic moment that doesn't have any collective meaning. All we do is we reflect it. But that's rubbish. That's a very defensive attitude that says, look at it in architecture, for example, rather than saying, we're going to build this new cities in which we have flying cars and we expand and we take over the countryside. We say, it's, no, 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 let's not mess things around. Let's look at the 19th century city and make it a little bit kind of more nicer and, and stuff like that. And that's a huge kind of self-limiting attitude. Where is the revolutionary impulse? The revolutionary, that's what I'm asking. The revolutionary impulse will come if there's a revolutionary impulse in society. There isn't. So you're on the, you're, in the, you're living the wrong game. You know. I mean, you're, 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 it's, it's, we, or we're trying to, or, or, or you're trying to give an excuse for your own kind of uh, lack of willingness to engage in. Any of that, I'd like to hear it. Um, 
surely the, um, the paradigm shifts in the past um, in the arts were sort of, they, they had a kind of resonance uh, amongst the public. Uh, maybe it wasn't big to start with, but it grew and grew and grew. And um, as much as you might want to think I'm a troglodyte, because I don't like the same art you do, um, I, I'm, I take students to Tate Modern um, most years, and it leaves them absolutely cold. And the only reason that Tate Modern has got loads of people in it is because loads of people go to Tate Modern. So more people go to Tate Modern. But uh, trust me, if you want to inspire originality, in teenagers, yeah, you will inspire the ones that want to go on to art school because they've already learnt that unless they can go to Tate Modern and discuss what's there, they're never going to make it as an artist. But it, the, it, can we not sort of discuss the image that the reason that people are not discussing the Turner Prize on the street in coffee bars in South London where I live is because it's crap. <laughs> Have we got any responses from the panel? Mike, bring the microphone man. Got paradigm shifts and skills. Does anybody have a point on the panel? Shoot, shoot, yeah. and let's take whatever people when it comes down. Yes, art, I think art is always a combination of skill and an original view or vision of things. So yes, I think you need skill, but you also have to have something original to say, and in the way you express yourself, which makes it particularly yours. Yeah. Well, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, going back to what I said originally, I. I don't think there's anything clever about sort of being disempowered in your art form and not being able to manipulate and communicate the material. So I would be in favour of that. I think technique is good because it allows, it gives us the flexibility, it gives us power over whatever materials we're, we're manipulating. Um, you know, if, if you've ever tried kind of making a sculpture out of a piece of wood without technique, you'll know, you know the limitations, the lack of it. Um, brings about, and you know, in every art form, I think there are so many basics that were drummed into a certain generation of us, and I don't think it's clever to kind of take them away from, uh, you know, from uh, a generation that come after. That seems to me to be pulling up the ladder. I, you know, I think technique, skill is choice, and I think if you give people choice over the materials, then they can take it from there as to whether they make sense or not. So I personally support that. I'm not going to be to address this question about rules. Of course, the, the idea of a rule in art is in itself very problematic. See, because one can define art as, in a sense, essentially breaking the rules. You see, that is going against the brain, showing people new ways of looking at things. And so there are no hard and fast rules by which one can judge, but this is what one should do if one is an artist. Um, yeah, I think skill is extremely important in conceptual art, and it's sort of like <coughs> skill in natural thinking, and that goes alongside the ability to produce uh, this sort of uh, gut emotion you want to put across. And I think that another thing that hasn't really been addressed is that these cerebral processes um, you know, we engage in to decide whether something or not, on the point, they completely miss the point. I mean, the work is comes from the gut and goes to the gut. It bypasses those rational processes. I think that's the thing that alienates people from contemporary art of the tone of pride. Mm. Um, the question kind of refers to authenticity, which was mentioned earlier, and then also kind of 90s art in your face and so on, because I think a lot of the public hostility to that School of Art the and the House and so on was because they didn't find it very authentic. And I wonder if the panel got any comments on that. Hey, you know, this polite young lady here. Mm -hmm. Keep your hands up so I see you because I will want to take your. Um, I, I would just kind of actually argue that the concept of paradigm shifts in art, that kind of view is really wrong. That actually, I would say that the kind of pro progress of art is actually a continual narrative and that um, although it may have you know it may have kind of uh, cliffhangers and it may have some moments that are bigger than others art is continually moving forward I think categorizing it as oh there was this you know modernism that there were these people who said you know there were people like Virginia Woolf who said no I'm just I'm don't, I don't need to write a book with chapters and I don't need to do you know I don't 
need to do it that way. I don't. I can float between my character's consciousness. I can do that. But I think that you know that's significant. But I think also many people have referenced several different points in the last decade where they feel there are movements. I think that art is continually changing, and that there is a kind of way in which we say it's simply saying the canon is this. We are always reflecting on the canon. We are always. I was. I recently went to a um, <coughs> university a talk like. Um, or possibly doing a degree in English, and one of the lecturers was saying, we want you to write about anything. We want you to write about those plays and write about like this author and say why they're really bad. Please say that. I want you to write about anything. You can write about the clothes in this piece. You can write about why this person, you know, is good in some way and they're good and bad. This person is good at poetry, this person is not. You know, they're, they're bad at theatre. Um, I think it's a continue that we are kind of like you said, art is breaking the rules. We are imposing rules in the way that we're looking at. We're saying this is the canon. We're saying if an opportunity means like this, I think that's the wrong way of looking at things. But that's what makes you that's very convenient. I think at the moment a lot of different forms of art and a different style styles of art are emerging <coughs> thanks to a massive expanse in communications. Um, I hate to say it, but also social media. There's a massive sharing of new styles of art at the moment. Loads of different styles are coming into existence. And I'm just putting it across the idea that maybe at the moment, at this current point in time, in the last few years, originality is maybe too commonplace for originality to even exist. It's just, it's everywhere, so how can we specify? <coughs> some is crap, some is really good. I don't know, I haven't studied art. But is there just too much originality to say what is really astounding anymore? Yeah. Let's bring you over here, Mr. Um, there's a gentleman here, and I can see something at the back, so I haven't forgotten you. It's an interesting point. I, I can never understand the idea of actually an artist setting out and saying, I want to be original. Yeah. Like, it's, it's just really strange. I think at the end of the day, originality is something that we see that is decided. Uh, not so much by the artist, but by the, the world itself. I think that Carl's point about uh, <coughs> about the, the near impossibility of originality today, I think, actually stems from the fact that it's not that it doesn't exist; it's that you can't see it. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact of uh, I think Piers mentioned about uh, having to work your play. I, I firmly believe that. Like, you know, you, you, you don't like classical music, you don't like art, you appreciate it, you don't appreciate it. And I think that's very important. There's a value that's gone, gone out, uh, I think. Um, I mean, one of the things that, uh, in, understanding, in understanding art, um, we, I, I went to an opera with, uh, well, the, the Handel Oratorium, which was made into an opera by Watch National Opera, so I'm dating. We have to question, the music's 250 years old, is it the word lyrics are 200? It was a very original uh, opera. Look at the um, in poetry, the sonnet, the sonnet from the Renaissance, invented in the Renaissance times, and still <coughs> the poets are still writing the, the original sonnets that it was the original with that form. So I think it's mainly actually down to the fact that like we don't the, the idea of actually working to and, and learning to appreciate your art is not one that's common uh, common coinage anymore. It's more like Yes, I like this, I like that. So, like, what uh, um, much art is, appears to be in these days is not original, but just a novelty. And I think it's accepted very much like that. Did either of you want to come back while we get the man over here? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
lots of borrowed visual references, but still stands as original as opposed to a lot of the borrowed visual references that we have in art today. So that kind of exercise in itself not valued anymore. But what I find it interesting is the people, for example, that complain about how the entire world is being globalized and have all these franchises everywhere, and they kind of all oh, can't span this world anymore. They go and reproduce the same graffiti in London and Paris and Cairo. They always look like the same everywhere, saying the same thing. And it's kind of almost like a, such a stark indication of the level of even being alternative and anti-system is in itself has become generic in a way. And that's just a depressing situation. Okay, so then Mr. Yeah, I'm just very worried by the, you know, the focus on originality for exactly the reason that the gentleman said that uh, originality is found, it's not, it's not searched for. And, uh, you know, I think the search is sort of doomed to failure. It's like the, the, the room of requirement in Harry Potter that you can't find it if you're looking for it. Perhaps you can only find it out if you're looking for it. Scholars can tell me. Um, but I think a much more useful concept is the one that this gentleman mentioned of authenticity, because one of the extraordinary things about the canon is that art that we already know renews itself. It's like a joke which we never get tired of. And you know, it's quite extraordinary that whereas you know we do get tired of a joke that we know the punchline, um, you know, the, the Brown symphonies that have been played across the hall in, 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 in the big uh, auditorium night after night never fail to amaze us with a punchline that we already know and that you know what could that's what we're, well I think that's what we're trying to do in art is to produce something whose retelling somehow encapsulates its freshness so I don't know how we do that but I think that it, authenticity means I don't know I, I'm interested to hear what this gentleman think what you think it means but to me, it's one of the, the core values of art, that it has something to do with the fact that the artist says something in the only way that he or she can. Um, that the artist has no choice um, at that point but to do this. And it's the opposite of the, the kind of cynicism to which the gentleman talking about um, Tate refer, you know, <coughs> referred. I'm not suggesting that any particular work is cynical, but you know, maybe some people have a feeling that some artists produced out of the need to be that thing at that time and, and that it will have a certain effect, whereas I think authenticity resides in the, the art where that is the only thing that the artist could do. And that kind of honesty somehow seems to produce renewal. Is it patient lady or lady, aren't you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just got a couple of points. Um, the first one is, um, in terms of dumbing down arts, are we dumbing down audiences? I think the need to look for um, qualitative and quantitative measures of how people are engaging with the arts is more problematic um, than the fact that we're dumbing down arts is the first point. The second point um, that I would like to raise is a question about the relationship between what we consider the canon and popular culture. I think we perhaps are getting to a position which is um, a point that related to raised earlier where um, due to some communication things are becoming far more widespread and um, commonplace. So perhaps there is originality within things that are deeply popular and that we have a problem with the fact that the subjects of contemporary art, for example, are very, very popular and that we're uncomfortable with how close that is to something like TV. Thank you. Yeah, can I just, yeah, please do. Um, yeah, I think that's very interesting. I was thinking that a lot of the debate Mixing up advertising with, with art and visual arts, area. it sounds like people are talking about the advertising media and the way artists use in advertising and originality uh, or popular ideas used in advertising. But um, I think that this authenticity thing is very interesting because I uh, I feel that uh, as an artist I feel completely misunderstood about the way I try to work, which is the absolute dependence on what I'm driven to do, what I can't not do. Yeah. It's not a choice. And I think this is where we totally agree and where I feel it's been mis uh, not being got by some people in the audience. Carl and then yeah, I think you people there. Just next to you, just just in front of you. Because you'll give me oh, now line. <laughs> <laughs> well, take Carl and then you I, I think that very last comment from there is very interesting to me guys. I think the highest form of drama now, high drama, it's coming out of America, is television. 
the most kind of popular medium. Look at the Sopranos, the Wire, things like that. Whereas American cinema is absolutely rubbish. Mm -hmm. and I think that's a very interesting suggestion. And there's an element of snobbishness there, where snobbism is saying, kind of, it's a popular media intelligence. It's almost like the legacy of the Frankfurt School is we have to be so dismissive of this brainwashing medium. Nobody takes it seriously. But actually, what does it do? It actually surprises us. And what makes it excellent is it puts its confidence and trust in the masses. And, and it actually, it's very rewarding. Unlike the very pretentious, self-referential, art house cinema, it's completely sickening. <laughs> um, I want to work out this thing about originality versus authenticity versus individuality. And um, I work as an illustrator. And I'm, I, it seems to me that when when something works, when I do a picture that works, it's when my individual experience of the world, we all, you know, in a sense, we all live in the same objective world. Could you speak into the mic? Yeah, sorry. In a sense, we all live in the same objective world. And, 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 and if you want, I guess I put it in, in, in a sense that when you create something out of your individual experience, as enables people that, that connects with other human beings and enables them to be able to see the same world in a fresh way, that's when you're doing something original. I agree with Dennis over there. So it's not something that you can't. If you start to try and do something original, you are going to fail. Um, it's, a, it's an objective thing that other people are able to see that society is able to, to judge your work with. But but it's not. It's more that you're able to connect with other human beings. Your, what you feel in there um, somehow gets translated through your through you creating something and enables other people to see the same thing. And it's not, it's not, it's not always like you're able to see the same thing that you're seeing and that's what makes it original. I'm not explaining this very well at all. Thanks, the universe. Can I, can I mention, just going back to this idea of skill, because I think one of the re reasons why classical music is so high bound is because but in art, um, there was Duchamp's rival and art changed, right? In music, there was Cage's 433 and nothing changed. It still hasn't changed. We're still high bound by the notated score. We think that that is the only way that we can, you know, that classical musician composers can create music. This is, uh, you know, this is astonishing to me. And I think it's one of the reasons why the biggest crowds for classical music, for music, are in the arts. And why the arts have stolen the lead, because they are more original. And this, I'm, I'm so perplexed by this cultural pessimism that I'm getting off of all of you and a lot of the, a lot of the young uh, people here. I mean, I, I think most people who go to take modern are very kind of engaged with the work and actually far more enjoy 20th, 21st century works than they do Mozart. I fear for Mozart and Haydn far more than I do for 20th and 21st century works. The future is now. I mean, we will, we will look on this period. As we will wonder, you know, what what happened before now? You know, what what did people paint before the nineteen hundreds? We will only be focused on what's happening now. It's the most exciting period for the for the arts. It's it's thrilling. Just open your eyes and go and find it. You know, I, but is it who are we going to remember in fifty years? Oh, so many people. I mean, I just think you have, you know, we could in some way, arts about is as good as your own brain. You know, I mean, if 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 you don't see if you don't think Tracy Evans is authentic, that's, that's a that's really very strange uh, concept. She's incredibly authentic artist, well, perhaps too authentic, you know? So, I mean, I just don't think any of you are. I don't think you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just basically think Okay, this is only about Tracy Evans. I'm completely self obsessed. It's self indulgent. You have a right to have a good you on you. But it's about about the artifice. It's about artifice. You just have to be quiet. Now. You just have to be quiet. Thanks. Lovely lady over here. Um, now, I just wanted to say uh, you were at one point suggesting that um, popular art was a uh, uh, bad influence on, or uh, that there's a division between high art and popular art. And all I was going to say is actually that division stopped even in the mid-1800s, the moment you have a realist artist like Corbet looking at erotic catalogues, um, borrowing images from photography, from catalogues, and from that moment on, many people borrowed, and Duchamp, okay, his legacy is the idea that the concept is valid, but nonetheless, he's looking at interesting shapes, he's borrowing the same way as Picasso, when he twisted 
a bicycle seat round the other way. And originally, humanity and art comes through in small incremental bits and you don't get a definite progression. You could say the canon of um, proportion, harmony, and uh, balance that's present in a Greek building or in a classical sculpture is the same notion that was used by Mondrian in just a few straight lines. So originality is not some clear break with the past. It can happen in bits and the person can then, like many artists, like Picasso in late life, become quite conservative again. But it's small and you can take what you like and the skill is what you use to express an idea. Skill is nothing if it doesn't express an idea that you have a passionate feeling that has to be expressed. Thank you. We're going to take this skill again. Can I just make sure I see the rest of your hands? So I've got you, and there's a hand over here. So that yeah, it's the left. Um, now I just want to say, um, was it to talk about the, there's a, a distinction between high brow and low brow here, and I think three, um, that maybe you have know, made a mistake in saying that nothing has happened in in music, or well, you've said nothing has happened in high brow classical music. But I think, what about popular music? I think I think making that That's distinction good. is well, I think making that distinction. I think there have been people can quote real progress that's been made in popular um, music, but things such as grime and um, dubstep and things which. Yeah, some of you might not know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> it is, uh, really, really, I, I was one of the people who had no idea what was going on until uh, my friends were listening to these things. And then I hear, as soon as I start to hear about it, about the news, it's still, as soon as it actually became popular, because it was an underground movement. So I think there have been, I think there's a high brow, low brow, you know, I mean, can you say that popular culture is low brow? No. That's a nice, concise answer. While we bring the mic over, here, did you just want to say something about contemporary? Well, I mean, just to, to sort of make a stand for pluralism, really, I don't understand the sort of caricature that you're offering my, the, the field I work in, because, you know, some people are doing things that are extremely informed by tradition, as, as you referred to, and some people are extremely informed by uh, making a break with it. So, I mean, I mean not thinking so much now, if we go back to the 1920s, we have a time where we have, you know, people like Elgar, you know, entirely informed by kind of European tradition and what they're doing, and yet I think we'd all agree that you know he has some kind of a voice. And then we had someone like Vares in France, absolutely informed by his inability to to kind of be informed by the past, absolutely <coughs> governed by a split and by a sort of a need to not do what people have been doing. And uh, you know, it's a plural world. I mean, the masses of music being written down, the masses of music not being written down. There are improvisers, there are people who communicate their instructions to players through scores, and I submit, you know, I'm one of those, but I don't see that. Is that, 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 is that I mean, what do you think about Arthur's point about being restricted by notated scores? Well, I mean, I always tell my students that we're a tiny minority and that we kind of hand people a written message and say, so here's my sound, you know. It's a very weird thing to do, and most music through, you know, around the world is kind of distributed by by repetition and you know without that and why do we do it? So I don't think we do it um, unconsciously and take it for granted. That's not a reason at all. Um, I think the tradition of Western art does that because it's a tradition of um, controlled messaging, if you like. I mean the same reason as we maybe write anything down rather than shout it out of the window is that we want to be uh, specific. And we've seen very interesting, if you study the history of meditation, it's very interesting the way Composers move towards a very, you know, at certain times in, in history, notation is extremely free and uh, leaves a lot of kind of leeway. Other times, for example, um, part of the 20th century, extremely precise, and composers have a kind of very high degree of control. And, for example, um, players, I think, uh, performers have a, a reaction against this, but it's possible to have music that's notated in a very loose framework. Um, to give you an example, I mean, I had a very moving performance of a piece by Shostakovich a few weeks ago by a string quartet. Everybody in the hall 
immediately sat up when they began because the sound was so extraordinary. And when we talked about it the next day in the seminar, they said there's nothing in the notation about that. It just says piano. And we create that sound, we work on the sound of that, and everything else is you know, different sound in the Tchaikovsky world. We create that as part of it. It's not in the notation, but the, the music was written down as a framework. And you know, there isn't a notation for timbre in that way. And often performers most like the sort of loosely notated work, which simply gives them the, that sort of framework. And there's a lot of frustration among my colleagues with the kind of composer who writes down a sort of fantastically detailed set of instructions. But that, you know, it's a spectrum. There are very detailed people and there are very loose people. I don't think it's like written down versus not. You know, I think it's a fantastically rich field. But I think there's a difference here between the different genre we're talking about. If you're standing in front of the Mona Lisa and the Louvre, you there you have the handiwork of one artist, and you can say this is the Leonardo, and, 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 and he's present to me there. And it's not the same thing when you're talking about the composer. A composer provides you with a set of instructions, but then you can go on and interpret them in so many different ways. So you can't say this is the ideal performance. You can always rediscover aspects of the if, as the gentleman was saying, if that's being done as originally and authentically, to use the word that was being used before. Okay, we're going to ask the troglodytes for our last few comments. <laughs> <laughs> I've got you, you, and you, so I want to make sure I've you. So, sir, have you got a mic? Yes, yes, I have got a mic, and I'm, I guess I'm a troglodyte, so I'm sure oh, that's okay. great. Um, I just see a, a logical problem with what you said earlier about art being about breaking rules. Because if everybody breaks the rules, it is then utterly unoriginal to break the rules. And in fact, some of the greatest bursts of creativity come from uh, working very tightly within the rules. If you think about Mozart, um, if you, you know, the, the actual forms that were used were, were very, very tightly controlled. Even the, the whole concept of the symphony is a, is a very specific discipline. And to break the rules too many times implies that there are no rules. And I'm being dragged over to Carl's point of view because I think that's the sort of postmodern situation we are in with the arts. And it, it, what it strikes me is that it's difficult to produce great music or great art at a time when it's not his, historically possible. Uh, and if you look at, you know, it's not an accident that Beethoven wrote some of his most uh, wonderful pieces in, in the immediate aftermath of the French Revolution. You can't sort of extract that and say he was just a genius on his own. And I think that the locating it historically uh, is, a, is a real difficulty. I think it's something that Palomar should face it. Yeah, so patient man at that. Hand up so you can see me again. Um, I think um, we need to kind of look back at uh, what the lonely voices in, in uh, art is up. We, 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 are, we are at the end where there's no great movement here. You know, the uh, uh, art movements uh, we saw in the 20th century. So, you know, we have to look for those then voices which may not be the popular contemporary art voices like Tracy Henning, who I would say actually recycles ideas from the Foxes movement, the Oko and Oli, the East Bourgeois century. And, 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 uh, so there's no originality there, it's, it's just a sort of narcissism. Um, I think, um, you know, there are incredible artists that are alive and well and actually probably are those lone wolves, uh, uh, lone voices. Um, where there's a kind of greater humanity that's being expressed, but you'll never see them win the term prize. You'll never see them, uh, you may get the odd solo show you know, uh, and, uh, here and there, but they're not going to be the sort of names that roll off uh, uh, people's uh, uh, everyday you know, kind of existence. Martin Creed, you know, he's, he's not at all original. I think he's you know, it's, it's an absolute emperor's new clothes. Um, and um, so, so, you know, we need to kind of go back to actually what are those uh, original voices. You know, Duchamp, I think, made a better you know, kind of a stroke of genius, but it's been done. And what we're having is a recycling of Duchamp. <coughs> identity. Okay, let's come down here. There's two people here, and then I think that's it. Thank you very much. on about the connection to society uh, in terms of originality and you know Carl made a good point which is that you know uh, there aren't artists today who are kind of 
questioning the kind of, you know, the status quo. And so even though there isn't like a huge upheaval in society, which in the past threw up all these um, artists, one expects artists to be slightly, uh, take a, criti a slightly critical questioning stance to the society they're in. Um, and, and, and it's not that we should just rely on society, you know, to, to just be uh, revolutionary before, you know, um, artists, um, uh, you know, say something original. Originality comes from being questioning, putting yourself um, uh, at a distance. And what you find with a lot of artists today um, is, is, is that they actually um, uh, reinforce a lot of the um, views of the establishment, you know, whether it's environmentalism or therapy or, you know, all these kind of issues. So in that sense, they're not original at all. And just one small point, though. I, I, I am, in all the art sessions that I've been in today, there's been a real um, horror of be, being able to say why you think something's good art. And I think, I don't know why people are so hesitant and ashamed to, to kind of say, well, I think this is good. I mean, I think most of us would like to be able to be discerning in that sense and know what are the things one should value and one shouldn't. You know, what's, what, what are the good things in art? So if they can say something about that. And yes. Uh, I was just going to uh, talk about inspiration. Because um, I'm a composer myself. I'm, I've been a professional clarinetist in my life, but I composed when I was young and kind of did really well with it and then got into, into playing. Um, but the way I write is, it may sound crazy to some artists here, but I'm literally totally, I think it was Piers and, um, sorry, just Jenny, is Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, talking about being driven, but I mean, I, I, I never ever think to myself, how can I be original? I mean, yeah. it just, it just literally, I, I feel that the inspiration comes to me, and then I write, and you know, it moves people to tears. <laughs> Hopefully not because it's crap. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I, I saw that something to, to mention because I think if you're in your heart, if you, if you compose or whatever in your Truth. I just think that that's that's the way you go. That's where I live. Thank you. Well, we certainly opened a can of worms there. I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring in the panel for their final remarks. You can't answer everything. That's a very broad-ranging discussion. So I want you to sum up the things that you think are the most important things for the audience to go over. In the order you began. So that means coming to Jane first. Jane. Uh, okay, well, thank you everyone for your contribution. I've certainly learned a lot, at least about what people think. I think the most interesting thing um, that came out of it for me is that it's not about originality for the sake of it. What, what's all this business? I don't understand that at all. It's about artists being authentic, and artists authentically expressing what they're genuinely driven to express. Um, you know, they really don't know what they're doing at the time they're creating, much like you were saying like that. Uh, and and um, there's a misconception there uh, that our artists are trying to be original. They're basically, um, the serious artists are just uh, doing what they are trying to do. And I think that's all they can do, really. And I think they're very interested in most of them. Thank you. Um, in the mic, in the mic. Yeah, oh, sorry. So I think um, overriding the thing that I have to sort of tackle is this idea of why does art break rules? Does art break rules too much? Art breaks rules so much because our society has broken all the rules. That's it. That is why art is so fast paced so kind of perplexing, baffling for us. We won't get it for another 50 years, I mean, but then we will and you'll love it. It's destined to kind of follow on slightly disagree with people. <laughs> um, I'm sure of anything else that uh, sure as sure can be about composition, which is all I know about, that there are no rules. There is only context in art. There have never been rules. Even things, for those of you who are interested in kind of, you know, nuts and bolts of music, even things like not writing 
consecutive octaves and voices they arose for a very good reason. They were practice. There were things that didn't happen because of how the language worked. Rules come and people theorize afterwards and they look back and say, people didn't do this, so that was a kind of rule of the time. I mean, the same way, uh, no, that's a different way. Um, I was going to say the same way people don't walk down the street with no clothes on, but there probably is a rule against that. But at the time, there are not rules, there are just things that you can do in an artistic situation. And for, that, for you, those are rules uh, at the time. Maybe you're not using a B flat or whatever. You know, it becomes a rule, but it's uh, totally artificial. It's simply context. It's what you do at that time. It's your wiggle room at that point. Wiggle. Wiggle. Yeah. 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 Yes, I said about the end of you that artists break the rules and the best of them break them in a radical way, and just like uh, Schoenberg broke the rules in music, or Picasso broke the rules in art, and Beckett in the theatre, James Joyce in literature, and so on. You can go on and on about that. Second point, there's room for the canon, and there's also room for innovation, and we need that both. And the third, third point, art is worth encouraging and supporting, because it plays an important role in our lives, not just one role, but many. And finally, art can make us feel uncomfortable. I remember when an art critic once asked the famous Swedish film director and filmmaker Ingmar Bergman whether he thought his films made people happy. Bergman replied, they may not make them happy, but they should make them think. Thank you. And Carl? Yeah, I want to close by reference to the two artists that I think were uh, discussed a lot. Uh, this afternoon, Duchamp and Cage, because their significance is completely misunderstood. And uh, the kind of their seminal works are remembered for their own reasons. What Cage and Duchamp came about with, what they introduced to art, is chance. It's not the idea of the Iranian science, because even science, 40, 43, 33, etc., came about by complete chance. That came about for a very specific reason. It was in a context to challenge the cult of the author and the, and the kind of the high creator of art. But that was a different context. What eventually happens is this form of chance becomes used as a tool, which is now almost routine, to undermine this very idea of human creativity and agency and the ability to impose disorder on the world. And I think enough is enough. The context has shifted. And we need to regain this ability to impose order in the world and mess it up. Thank you.